We're live. Well, good afternoon, Mesa Public Schools. We are so happy that you are here to join us for our weekly Facebook Live session. Today, we are talking about the um, a transition from junior high into high school. We know how important that is. So I have a really special guest today, um, Mr. Casey Eagleberger. He is the principal of Red Mountain High School. And uh, he's the former principal at Smith Junior High. So he is the perfect guest to talk about what does this whole junior high experience look and feel like? And then what does it look like to successfully transition into a high school? And not only is uh, Mr. Eagleberger um, an amazing administrator and a really committed Mesa Public School employee, he's also a dad. So he knows how to, to navigate all of this from the lens of, of a father as well as from an, an administrator. And I think that's really important. So welcome, Casey. I'm so glad that you're here today. Thank you, Dr. Fortas. Thank you, and I have to tell you, um, happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you. I was mentioning to uh, Mr. Eagleberger before we got started today that I had the pleasure of being in an elementary school today where I got to learn a lot about how leprechauns can disrupt a first grade classroom, and boy, was that amazing. So um, I think I still have green glitter stuck to the bottom of my shoes, and um, I searched for uh, leprechaun footprints. So it was pretty amazing. So it's got to be a great day in Mesa Public Schools today. So let's get started talking about this uh, idea of what we offer in our junior highs and our high schools and how we work on that transition. So we had some questions that came in early to us. And the first one is, are all junior highs and high schools in Mesa the same? And so not only um, is Mr. Eagleberger a principal of Red Mountain High School, he's also a graduate of Mountain View and has worked across high schools and junior highs. So this is a great conversation for you to kick off for us. Are all junior highs and high schools in Mesa the same? Well, I'll give a, a great answer of yes and no. Um, <laughs> So for the most part, uh, the, the commonalities of a junior high and high school in Mesa is you transition where you're gonna go to uh, five, six, seven classes a day, depending on where you're at. So that structure is normal and you have a lunch or two lunches or even sometimes three lunches uh, in between. So that structure is there, uh, which is similar, but each high school is unique in terms of, and junior highs, whether it's a different program, um, We've been lucky to have some autonomy in the way we create our scheduling. Um, so, so that's nice to fit the needs of our, uh, our, our kids and our families. Um, you have different, like I said, different programs that are unique to it. So uh, those are differences and it's important to find out what's the best fit for your child and where they're gonna be successful. I, I think the key is, is don't believe what you hear all the time um, in those transitions, whether it's from sixth grade to seventh grade or eighth grade to ninth grade. Um, it goes a lot better than what you hear it's going to be. And whether it's seniors or kindergarten, I think all educators, principals and families want the same environment um, to make it their best day. So, um, you know, don't don't believe those horror stories about what may happen at the next level because we're looking to make those transitions as, as seamless as possible. That's excellent. That's really great advice. Um, so let's talk about that transition. Let's think about that sixth grade parent. Um, I'm the parent of a sixth grader transitioning to junior into junior high next year. Um, what are the most important things for me to know as a parent and how can I help my child prepare, especially during this very unusual year that we've had um, through the pandemic? What, what would be your advice, not only as an administrator, but you've done this with your, your boys. How does this work? Yeah, I'm probably better with other kids than my own boys and they probably attest to it. So <laughs> My, my girls guess. would say the same. <laughs> so um, one is just a demeanor as an adult in their life is being as positive as possible because they're paying attention to what you're saying. And again, when I go back to that first question is making it, it's gonna be a good situation. So when you talk about sixth graders going to seventh graders, you know, one of the exciting things is that they do have uh, a multitude of classes um, and they're switching around. Um, they enjoy those junior high lunches. I don't know if the adults would enjoy watching the junior high lunches, but the kids really enjoy the socialization um, and, and some of the freedoms that they get going to, to that level. Uh, also the programs of study and the electives and our junior highs uh, are really well equipped with so many neat um, 
uh, facilities. You know, if, if those of you don't know, we used to, our junior highs were built to have the ninth grade on campus originally. So our junior highs are pretty unique uh, compared to other surrounding districts about what they offer. So I think building the excitement of things they get to see and do, uh, it's important whether it's just driving by or making uh, an appointment uh, to see the schools, to meet people. Obviously with the mitigation things, sometimes there's parameters around that. But as much comfort as they can have of being on campus, the earlier the better. And the other, the other thing is really start looking at the websites. They do such a great job in terms of what's your bell schedule, what are the practices, what are some of the, the expectations that the schools have, um, you know, the time of day when you start. Junior highs are going to start later. They're going to get out earlier. So you start developing maybe some sleep schedules. Um, I just think all those things are important. Um, and the organization, what they need to be organized. Because if you if you don't have something or you can't uh, get your child something, you know, schools have uh, many ways to find uh, things that they can help and, and give guidance. Um, uh, you know, I can attest to all those junior high principals and staff. Um, it's a great group of people. I mean, uh, junior high uh, educators are wired uh, differently but it's perfect for the junior high kids and it's an emotional time so i think the junior high goal is always what was our goal is we're going to spend a lot of time teaching kids how to get organized and we may not see it in the two years they're here but we'll know that when they get to the high school that we're, we're teaching them skills academic skills and social skills and I, I really think it's important when they leave uh junior high if they've got good academic and uh behavior and social behavior they're going to be absolutely fine in high school but I uh, hope that helps Dr. Ford us a little bit. Absolutely. And and, I, and I've got to say, I guess I'm one of those specially wired people because I was a middle school teacher. And uh, you just have to look at how you um, design curriculum and how you engage and build relationships with kids um, specific to their age group. And boy, those middle school kids, those junior high students um, made me laugh every single day. I think that one thing that I would add as a parent of um, now three adult uh, girl, I, women, young women now, I still think of them as, as my little girls. Um, one of the things I think to help uh, prepare them for that transition into junior high is how to appropriately advocate for themselves. If they don't know something, how do they ask? How do they um, look for direction? Who are the trusted people on that campus that they can go to? And I think that that's really important um, to equip them with those skills and that they can use not just as they transition into seventh grade, but throughout their life. And th that's what we know. We know that our kids who um, continue to pop back up and are resilient are those who are able to advocate and, and help to navigate their course themselves. So I'm going to go on to another one. Now we're going to switch gears. My child is going to be going into high school next year. We're all really excited and a little bit nervous about it at the same time. What are the most important things for me to know as a parent and how, how can I help my child prepare for that transition? They've navigated seventh and eighth grade and now they're going into high school. And let's think about these eighth graders that are going into high school. They've had a pretty unusual year. They have not had a typical junior high experience. So I guess one thing that I would like our families to know is that we're paying attention to that as a school district and we're really thinking thoughtfully about what does that look like? We know it may not be typical. So some of the of your thoughts, Mr. Eagleberger. Uh, some of the same things apply, just familiarizing yourself with as many things about the school uh, without being on it, which, you know, bell schedules, et cetera. But uh, the transition to eighth grade and, and to ninth grade, um, with the exception of algebra and, and uh, foreign language at the junior high, which is two credits you can earn at the junior high for high school, uh, that ninth grade year is imperative because it's really the first chapter in terms of what somebody sees on paper about your academic um, behavior. So it's important to be as organized and prepared early to understand how valuable that is. Uh, and, and again, going to high school is a lot of excitement. I mean, there's there's so many opportunities and programs at all the high schools. Uh, you hear a lot about, um, well, it's so big. There's so many kids. You know, at Red Mountain High School, we may be anywhere from 3,200 to 3,500 and every high school is at least over 2,000. So um, if you just feel like, oh my gosh, it's that big, then there's always going to be a little bit of an anxiety problem. So what you have to do, even as adults, we have to do the same thing, is just, just know that within those high schools, um, we work really hard to create smaller uh, programs of study 
and um, you know extracurricular activities. And if you if you think, well, geez, that's there's just nothing that seems to interest me. Believe me, there will be. And so you start focusing on that, uh, making a big high school smaller for your child or for the child. You're going to be successful. You're going to get connected because um, you're going to be involved with certain people. Um, even if you're not really into extracurricular activities, but there's an area of study that you like, there's plenty of clubs and there's mentors. And if you feel like your child is not connecting, reach out, reach out, reach out. Because one good thing about, of many things about being a big size high school and these questions come to me all the time, moving from a junior high principal to a high school principal, I say, yes, there's more kids and people, but there's more staff and help and, and people equipped to take care of needs. So. Um, and we talk a lot about, uh, again, taking the time early when they transition to ninth grade about teaching them, um, you know, how, how to get through the day and not jumping right into curriculum and teaching them because they don't know. They've spent, in some cases, in elementary school for seven years, uh, a two-year stop at the junior high, which, which goes fast, and then you get into high school. So really, you know, we, we sometimes... Uh, we, we have to uh, slow down to understand that it wasn't too long ago that these students were in sixth grade and they had spent seven years at elementary school uh, right in their neighborhood. And we have to step back and say, well, we have to teach them to do that because they may have had different systems and structures in the last three years. So point is, ask when you feel like this just doesn't seem right and trust your instincts. And if you don't get the answer you really think answered it, um, you know, reach out again. And, you know, we all, sometimes we may give an answer that's not the best answer at the time. And by all means, it's okay to reach out again, say, you know, Mr. Eagleburger, for example, we spoke a month ago and I don't, not sure I really got the answer. And then, okay, let me see if I can take another avenue to, to do that better for you. So uh, there are people to connect with and we want to do that. So don't hesitate to reach out. You know, that's really great advice. Um, I had an opportunity to um, participate in some student listening sessions and town halls uh, with our sixth graders, groups of uh, junior high and high school students, and it was pretty amazing. Um, if I could summarize what our kids want in their junior high experience and their high school experience, I could summarize it in two words. They want relationships and they want collaboration. So everything that you've just talked about, Mr. Eagleburger, um, of reaching out, and there is so much that we offer in all of our, our high schools and our junior highs, but I think our, our larger high schools, um, when I speak to families and I speak to kids, one of the other th phrases that comes up that says, you know, in our high school, there's a place for everyone. And so you've got to find that niche. And so maybe you may not find it, the student may not find it the first time. If it's not that club, there's another club. There's another leadership experience. There's another class that can be taken. There's another extracurricular activity. So always looking for that ways to make connections because our kids thrive on those relationships and uh, collaborating with one another. So we've talked um, about um, transitioning into junior high, transitioning into high, and a high school. We're going to jump in and start thinking about preparing for college and future career. We know that that's very important. Uh, in fact, in the listening sessions, our high school students said um, one of our challenges is meeting the demands of our families, and and trying to um, fulfill the expectations of our families while trying to learn about who they are as they as they chart their course. So, um, preparing for college and the and future career is so important important to many, many um, children and their, and their families. So um, Casey, can you talk about the career exploration opportunities at the junior high school level? Yeah, um, go back to, you know, the, the history behind our junior highs, they were built um, for ninth graders. So um, what that allowed for was great facilities. And, and so you had many, you have space um, and career explorations uh, with different programs. So um, you have industrial technology areas, you have culinary areas, you have robotic areas, you have big space um, for kids to work and discover. And the junior highs have done a really nice job within their schedules is prioritizing time and giving kids opportunity to take those classes um, to explore their different interests. So maybe there's, there's interest in, in robotics for one student and then the other student industrial technology and then culinary arts for one and the facilities are phenomenal. Um, you know, sometimes you just get lucky to be at buildings where you have that space and 
it was a priority for the junior highs to continue those programs. And our CTA director, uh, Marla Loria, does a good job in terms of supporting those. And so that's really the key for a lot of kids, why they're coming to school, and that's their hook. And there's just so many great elected teachers. So, you know, let's take a, say a student in seventh or eighth grade takes uh, robotics, or they take a culinary class, or they take an IT class. So they start discovering what they're really interested in. And then what that leads to is at the, you go to the high school, so now you're entering for four years, and it really starts to hone in about what their specific interests are. And then you get these programs of studies for three, four years for a high school student. But that, that, that's all attributed to what their experience is in the junior high. And that's something to look forward to in terms of what they can have opportunity in. Um, so short answer is, yeah, they can start discovering and having opportunity and materials provided to them uh, to start exploring those, those interests. And then that leads to the next uh, phase when they transition to the high school. You know, so I'm going to do a, a, a commercial. It's a little bit uh, premature because we don't have all of our details finalized, but I can tell you, um, stay tuned in the next few weeks. You are going to be hearing as a community, we will be um, making you very, very aware of our summer academy program that we'll, we will be planning across our school district. Every school in Mesa Public Schools will have a summer academy, and many of our junior highs and high schools are focusing on those opportunities for career exploration. So I know that the principal at Shepherd uh, Junior High and I were having a conversation and talking about um, weaving in mathematics um, concepts within uh, culinary. And so giving kids ideas around what are they interested in, um, a focus on the arts, a focus on um, technology and, and science related uh, concepts. So um, keep your eyes open. We were going to have the most amazing summer academies across Mesa Public Schools. Um, so I also, another part of that question is what schools offer dual enrollment? So let's first talk about what dual enrollment is. Uh, in the state of Arizona and in Mesa Public Schools, we have taken advantage of an opportunity where our high school students um, can enroll, can be at their high school taking a course that is college credit through uh, Mesa Community College. And um, when they graduate, not only do they have a high school diploma, but they already have some college credit in the bank. And, and that's really important for our kids, especially those kids that are gonna be staying in state, because we know that those college credits um, from Mesa Community College, they transfer into our state universities. So it's a really great way for kids to um, build that really strong runway from high school into um, college. So Mr. Eagleburger, you wanna talk about some of the dual enrollment, and by the way, dual enrollment is offered at all of our high schools, all of our comprehensive high schools. You wanna talk about some of the courses that you have or some that come to mind for you? Yeah, just, just for example, and there's, you know, a, a growing amount of courses, whether it's a foreign language or, or a, a science or English uh, in, in many subjects. And those students who have uh, decided that they're taking that college uh, path, uh, you know, one for parents and for students, it's an economic advantage as well, too, because you're what you do is you sign up through Mesa Community College, but the class is on our campus in this case or any other high school and it's taught by one of our own faculty members. So a student, uh, their, their, their day's not disrupted where they're having to go to a different campus. They're taking that class with their peers. Um, that class is just designated for dual enrollment. Um, they take that class all year. And then as Dr. Fortas said, they get credit um, for, for college. Um, you know, statistically, it's, it's pretty heavy percentage that most students uh, in Mesa schools are gonna stay in state. Um, so really with that dual enrollment uh it, it's just been real beneficial to to get ahead um and one one you're getting college credit but you're also getting exposed to college curriculum and a style of teaching and learning that maybe you would see uh although it's not on their campus but you know whether it's expectations or what your re uh retake policy is or can you take a test again getting used to um kind of a, a gateway in terms of what the college offers um, it, there is a cost to it that you pay at MCC, but it's going to be cheaper than it is um, if you didn't do it and you were paying for extra classes at the college. So I can I can identify with the economic on a personal level because I do have a son who's in college. So uh, it never seems to get cheaper. Um, so, uh, you know, that's the reality. 
and it's just been a, it's a good opportunity and and it provides a good environment and a good setting for kids uh, and, and staff um, and it's it's focused I mean they're they're taking a class not only for a high school credit but a college credit so it's a it, it creates quite a, a um, academic environment uh, in a college setting it's almost practice in a sense for the next phase that they're going to go into in college yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you, uh, Casey. As as a mom of a sophomore at Arizona State University, it was really a confidence builder for her to go into um, her freshman year already with some college credit in the bank and felt like, I can do this. So um, I think it's really important for so many different reasons. Financial, certainly financial was a good win for us as well. Um, so can you walk us through what does a typical day look like for a junior high student and then we'll do the same thing for a, for a high school student or maybe you can talk about how they're similar and different. What does that day look like? What should, how can parents be visualizing this? Um, I, I can't help but smile because the first thing that came to my mind about junior high kids, you know, there's a special place for junior high kids. One just, they're so different as they're developing. And I, I picture a rainy, my first thought was a rainy day and all the kids running around in the courtyard at the junior high. Uh, that wouldn't be the same react at the high school. But, um, you know, so junior high typically, um, you know, kids aren't driving or they shouldn't be driving. They're either getting bus to school or dropped off or walking or riding their bike or their skateboard or scooter or whatever it is. And uh, they usually, you know, start to congregate 20 minutes or 15 minutes before school starts um, in a typical year. And then, bell rings and they go to class for typically uh, an hour or close to an hour or maybe at some of the junior highs a little over an hour and they transition five six times a day and lunch is uh, sandwiched in between um, yeah, and that's pretty typical um, you know most kids are really good about getting to class on time and teachers are outside their doors welcoming kids in in an environment and um, you know um, typical junior high behavior and teenage behavior and socialization and um, there's a lot of help and there's people out whether it's administration security teachers so um, you know for the most part it's a really safe place in terms of you know eyes on kids and then um, that's a junior high uh, high school a little different because you see a lot more cars in the parking lot um, you know and that's that's reality I mean you know, you, you, you really think of them each day because driving to school, especially those, you want to make sure that it's safe. And so you'll see a lot of structure in high school parking lots from the, um, the way that when the school day begins, uh, you'll usually have security out in the parking lot, making sure that kids are arriving and then moving into the class uh, with kids coming from the parking lot. Uh, you'll have security set up, checking IDs, perhaps kids come into um, a school setting. Most kids start to congregate the high school 15, 10 minutes, a little bit later. Uh, than you would see at the junior high. Um, day starts at 8.15, kids go to four, five, six classes. We have two lunches at uh, um, Red Mountain High School. I think most high schools have a couple lunches. Those aren't divided up by any, usually by buildings, so you'll have mixed grade levels um, on our campus. Is that any couple. fancy food at Red Mountain during lunch? Uh, not that I not that I know. I'm sure there is. I, that's, a, that's a trap question for me. So, uh, I'm just watching kids and uh, more and more, um, more and more schools have gravitated letting kids um, out across campus because what that does is, you know, maybe before you wanted them all confined and you had to watch, I mean, even pre COVID, but the concept of letting kids get out and socialize and, and spread out over campus, it, it's, gives them safe places to be, not not because there's dangerous places, but just kind of safe emotionally to see their friends, you know, maybe they have a certain area. So they're really spread out on campus um, because we want them to enjoy that time. Uh, there's a lot of stress going on I instead of confining them to areas and more worried about that it's got to be perfectly clean. We want them to get their food, find a place to eat, and that helps create a calmness during lunchtime. Uh, in the afternoon, you'll see on a high school campus, there's a little bit more hustle and bustle because, for example, seniors may be leaving uh, early. Um, they, they only take four classes, some of them do, and then they're going off to uh, work or wherever they may go. Uh, there's a lot of athletics and extracurricular activities going on, so kids are all over and the size of the campus. But again, you have more people. So, um, you know, I, I hope that's not, not too uh, unimaginable, but, um, you know, there's 
you may drive by and see, man, there's a lot of people just moving around, but there's a lot of behind the scenes and on the front line, so to speak, with people watching. There's cameras everywhere. We've been fortunate for our district to support us. So there's there's a lot of areas that are always monitored, um, you know, and, and um, just trying to create an area where kids can experience, you know, kids want to be safe and they want to have relationships and they want to have opportunity and success. And so that's the goal every day on each campus. And it may seem chaotic at times, but really it's a con controlled chaos. But a lot of people make an effort to, 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 to be preventive and, um, you know, make it a, a good experience each and every day. Well, I sure applaud the work of our uh, secondary principals, our junior high principals, our high school principals, because um, if you think about it, if you were in a small town in the Midwest, uh, our high schools are larger than the populations of some, some small towns. And so you coordinate a small city every single day. And with that brings a ton of resource and opportunity for our kids. So, um, I, you know, it, it's so great uh, to be with superintendents from other districts and say, do you have that type of a program? Do you have that type of a program? And about 99% of the time I can say, yes, we have that at somewhere, someplace, because we we really have the resources to, to align to the needs and wants of our children. Um, whether they're little preschoolers all the way up to our seniors who are graduating and running off into the world of, of, of college and career. So uh, I'm gonna go to this, I, I know I did a, a kind of went off script and did a little, uh, preview in a commercial on our summer academies. And we have a question that is coming to us on, will there be transportation for summer academies? And that, that answer is yes. Uh, we want to make it as accessible as possible for all of our families across Mesa Public Schools. So the answer is yes, with more details to come. So um, a, set your uh, agendas. April 7th, we will be doing Facebook Live all about Summer Academy so you can get the latest and the greatest and the best information. So I'm going to wrap up with our last question here, which is um, talking about um, parent involvement. We tend to understand what it looks like at an elementary level to be involved uh, in, your, in your child's education. So what does that look like when you move into the secondary schools? What does it look like at junior high? What does that look like at high school? Um, and oftentimes it looks really different. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about what is that appropriate um, and, and comfortable type of uh, parental involvement in both junior highs and high schools? I, I think it's always uh, certainly uh, encouraged and, you know, as a parent, uh, you know, it's try to be involved as you can. I uh, Sometimes I know, like, uh, when my kids were at junior highs, I don't, I don't think they wanted me to be by them. Uh, whether it was in school or out of school. So sometimes that's dictated by the kids. But at the secondary level, you know, you spend seven years at elementary school. So that is that is a piece where you're constantly trying to find the fit. You In a formal setting, you have your SIAC groups and then uh, different schools, more success than others at different schools. How do you, how do you encourage a volu uh, volunteer and create systems and, and, a, and a certain process to do that? So, uh, one, just inviting groups of parents in, uh, being accessible as you can. And I think always as a parent, uh, never feel like you can't call or come in. Um, and, uh, you know, right now I'm always thinking it's so hard not to think about COVID and that stuff, but in, in a more normal year uh, to do that, um, you know, because it, it does no good to create, um, uh, you know, a separate uh, school and then community. So it's just finding ways, and a lot of times the parents bring the best ideas about how they can help and support. Uh, most high, high schools will have uh, several booster clubs, whether it's their um, extracurricular activities or athletics. So you, you get a lot of involvement there. When you talk about school-wide, I said the formal setting was SIAC, but I know there's certain high schools and other junior highs that have parent groups more on an informal basis that, that just simply volunteer time and resource or even food in some cases, teacher appreciation. So, you know, any principal in um, school is looking for that help. And so uh, sometimes it's just a matter of, of, of getting people to bring ideas where you say, yeah, I've been, I've been waiting for that to happen. Because there's also, you know, we also know that parents are doing a ton of stuff with their kids and they're working and they're doing all the things parents do. And, and you walk that fine line, we don't want to appear like we're pushing too much for them to do more. So sometimes just reach out and say, hey, is there any way I can help the school? That kind of creates uh, an invite to say, yeah, we've been waiting uh, We've been waiting for something like this to happen. And here's some things that we just need volunteers and people on campus. I mean, a lot of research out there that says 
you know, it doesn't always have to be one teacher for 30 kids that just adult influence, whether that's in a formal setting as an educator who's hired there or if it's just volunteer, um, you know, kids just need to find one person somewhere that they can identify with. And sometimes that comes from where you never saw it. It might have been a person who volunteered on a certain day. So we continue to try to look for that, especially at the high school. Like I said, that, that's been a little bit to nobody's fault. Obviously, we're, we're living in a unique situation here, but when, when that starts to become more available, you know, we look to find ways to do that uh, just to give kids as much support as we can because we, we know they need it. I really appreciate that. And, you know, some families might be thinking, wow, I really wish I could spend time actually at the school during the school day to be involved. Um, but rest assured, there are many uh, two-parent working families um, that can stay involved in many, many ways, including um, staying active in our parent portal through uh, what we call Parent View, where you can take a look at your students' grades, take a look at their um, assignments, how well they're doing, and then reaching out to that teacher and connecting with them, sending an email, a phone call, setting up a time that's still very appropriate to do at the secondary level. So um, it's always good to get it on the front end before there's a problem to solve. So uh, that's helpful to our principals and to our teachers as well. Uh, we do have another question that came in, and um, it is, will remote learning be available next year? And that answer is yes. At the elementary, the junior high, and the high school level, we will have a, rem um, a remote learning option. Uh, we are finalizing the details of that as well. We are planning summer academies and what our uh, learning models will look like next year. Um, so stay tuned. But if you you are planning and you feel that remote learning is a good option for you, for your children, for your family, um, uh, we are planning for kindergarten through 12th grade. So um, hang on for more information coming your way. Well, I have to say, Mr. Eagleburger boy, those 30 minutes went fast. It's already 432. So you shared a tremendous amount of information with us. And um, I'm so grateful for uh, your knowledge and for your expertise and for all that you do for Mesa Public Schools and for uh, sharing with our community this afternoon. So thank you very much for joining us. We're so glad that you were uh, with us and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.